To die, to sleep, to sleep a chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come. Kia ora, e te whanau. Marky here, with his dark sunglasses on, in a nod to my inner goth because the subject of this video is a very obscure one. It's demystifying an obscure song on an obscure subject by an obscure band. <laughs> if you're still with me and you're up for the ride, today we are going to talk about the song called Last Exit for the Lost by the Fields of the Nephilim, which is gently playing in the background. I'll allow this to fade out because much as it's atmospheric it's distracting me hope that created a little bit of mood at the beginning anyway so i'm going to take these sunglasses off as well because they're putting me off as well so the fields of the nephilim so most of you will be going who the what of the what and some of you will be going ah the fields of the nephilim they were good so the fields of the nephilim were and are a rock band uh, usually uh, placed in the goth genre, though people always seem to argue about these things. They are to me anyway, but you know, the music is music. And they play a uh, very, very complex, multi-layered, uh, atmospheric, dark music. And not easy listening by any means. Um, <laughs> the opposite of easy listening, but they're kind of worth the effort. Or I think they're worth the, I think they're, they're certainly one of my favorite bands and their um their lyrical content uh is is also kind of quite difficult to unravel to the uninitiated no pun intended uh because the uh the um, the main creative force behind the band Carl McCoy uh is an occultist and a chaos magician among other things so he draws on lots of things including the works of uh, Crowley but he also draws on um kind of wild western imagery and you know, masses of things you know different films often quite obscure films so the lyrics are very obscure the, the lyrics are also very evocative um which, which i think they work really well because they kind of hint at things rather than spelling things out so the fields of the nephilim let's explain the name first because that's a pretty obscure name so not many people uh even people even christians and people that purport to know the bible well uh often talk about the nephilim um it's quite a, an obscure so if you, you can guess from the name really it's got that kind of jewish uh, hebrew sound to it and uh if you think what does it remind you nephilim well it, it sounds a little bit like cherubim doesn't it or seraphim okay so you're on the right lines with that the nephilim uh, uh, and this is this is in your Bible. The Nephilim were the hybrid children of angels and women. Okay, so the story goes that uh, a particular band of angels were uh, were watching the earth and became enamoured by the beauty of the women and came to earth in material form and bred with them and produced a race of giants. Now the, the angels were known as the Watchers and they were supposed to have given man a lot of uh, forbidden knowledge and advanced knowledge, uh, knowledge of warfare and technology and all kinds of things. So they were the Watcher Angels, nothing to do with the Watchers as in Buffy, not Giles the Watcher, different kind of Watcher. And the offspring, who were giants, were known as the Nephilim, and they're referred to in the Bible. Uh, it's a really interesting subject. And there are other cultures that kind of talk about similar things, like um, there's the Anunnaki and other things. So, so whether the Nephilim uh, are, were real uh, or whether they're just mythical um, is a kind of pretty cool story uh and one of the videos i want to do at some point um i want to talk about uh demonic possession phenomena because i'm interested in that from all different points of view from a psychological medical point of view and an occult point of view and a spiritual point of view uh one of the things that we'll we'll touch on a similar subject really is when people talk about demons and they're talking in the judeo-christian sense so evil spirits um 
that is, I'm going off on a wild tangent here, by the way, but I kind of, you know, if, you, if you're watching my channel, you must realise by now that like, this is the kind of, these are the kind of um, rabbit holes I go down. So the, uh, the kind of standard, most common explanation for demons and evil spirits is that they, uh, they were the, uh, the armies of Satan that were thrown out of heaven after trying to rebel against God unsuccessfully, and then are the evil spirits. But there's another theory among uh, again Judeo-Christian um, Bible scholars that evil spirits are actually the spirits of the dead Nephilim. Okay, so that's another interesting one, isn't it? So I just thought like I'd throw that one in. People don't talk about this stuff very often, do they? Perhaps there's a good reason for that. So the that's where the name comes from. The fields of the Nephilim isn't that they're kind of, you know, into um, agriculture. Um, the fields refers to energetic fields. So the energetic fields of the Nephilim. So it's a really mystical title. So some of the things that they draw upon are very, very, very obscure. He's a very clever guy. He is Carl McCoy. He's a really clever graphic designer, amazing musician, songwriter, and um, he knows his stuff uh, when it comes to um, mythology and occult and all that kind of thing. So, and, and some of the, for example, there's an album called Zune, which I believe is, I think it's either based on the book of Daniel or the book of Enoch and the book of Enoch isn't in the current Bible it's one of the many works that wasn't included in the, in the Bible I need to check that so that's the fields of Nephilim a uh, fantastic band very dark um, they kind of wear big hats and kind of um, leather you know kind of a wild western kind of style and they had a kind of post-apocalyptic western heroes image um, I particularly love their music because I find it very 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 evocative I think I'm borderline synesthetic in that um, I can almost feel or see music sometimes and I find when I listen to their music it kind of creates a in my mind a landscape I, I can I'm almost transported somewhere so it's a very very interesting band and not for everyone you know, so, um, you know, if you check out the Fields of Nephilim and you think, oh, my God, what a noise, um, then, you know, that's not a surprising reaction because, you know, they, they take a lot of work. <laughs> but I've been listening to them for about 30, 30 years and I'm only just kind of unravelling. I'm quite slow to pick up melodies and things, so I'm certainly just unravelling their work now. So uh, they have written a number of songs on a another obscure particular theme, uh, which crosses over with one of my other passions and interests and that's what I'm going to talk about today so on their second album they uh, they did a fantastic song called Last Exit for the Lost and I've looked on um, song meaning websites and seen people kind of interpret this and talk about what it is but nobody really seems to be on the mark with it but Marky's on the mark so I'm going to share with you what that song is all about Okay, if you're interested. Uh, I guess if you're not, you'd have zoned out long before now. So, last exit for the lost. So, it is all based on the uh, novel, What Dreams May Come. Hence my little Shakespearean soliloquy at the, at the start, which comes from Hamlet. Uh, famous to be or not to be scene where Hamlet is contemplating suicide. And you know, and the sling. He talks about the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. So, so what he's basically saying is, you know, God, life is hard. Um, you know, suicide would be a much easier option. Um, and that's you know, that's something that many people consider. And certainly in the work I do, that's you know, a, a, a recurrent issue and uh, people feeling suicidal. Um, I like to think I always say that people don't commit suicide out of self-destructive impulses. They commit suicide out of self-preserving impulses. They don't try to kill themselves because they want to kill themselves. They kill themselves because they want the pain to stop and they, they feel that their current circumstances are unbearable and they're seeking relief. So it's not, in a way, it's not a self-destructive act in principle. Um, it's a very destructive act for other people. And we don't know what the consequences of suicide are because we don't know what happens after death. And that's what Shakespeare is saying is, you know, oh, suicide would be, you know, bring peace, would bring sleep, it would bring relief. Well, yeah, if it brings sleep, but is it is it just sleep or, you know, are there dreams, are there other experiences after death? And maybe, you know, they, they wouldn't necessarily be 
good ones. So, so the novel that came out, um, Richard Matheson uh, wrote this novel back in 1978, a long, long time ago. He's written lots of sort of horror stuff and that kind of thing. But What Dreams May Come is not a horror film, although it has some horrific elements to it. It's about the life after death experience and also uh, talk, features uh, the consequences of suicide in the afterlife. Uh, so it's a work of fiction, uh, but actually if you, if you read the book, it says that um, it's only partially a work of fiction, that all the metaphysics of it are based on reality, uh, but just the, the, the kind of more narrative parts are a work of fiction. So I'm going to pause the video now and break it into part two because at the moment I'm still having uh, difficulties recording longer videos or posting longer videos. So I'm going to I'm going to cut this one now and be back with you very shortly for part two. See you soon.